Thanks for having me. I'm going to try to get a brewed, home-brewed IPA on the menu for uh, later tonight instead of mimosas, if that's okay with everybody, but we'll work on that later. Um, so I'm going to concentrate mainly on SGRT use and SBRT. We've implemented this uh, in our practice in various techniques over the last two to three years. And so my objectives here, uh, we're going to review use of uh, OSMS and daily setup prior to IGRT for SBRT treatments uh, and show some quantification data on how that limits uh, interfraction shifts prior to Combi MCT. I'm going to review, review the use of OSMS and continuous monitoring during SBRT treatments to detect interfraction motion and show some of the data we've acquired on that as far as how well OSMS correlates with repeat IGRT in that situation. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about respiratory motion management during SBRT and use of OSMS and show a good case where I think uh, uh, breath hold SBRT really made a difference in a patient uh, and uh, that type of treatment. So I think, as with other treatments, uh, SBRT necessitates a very high degree of confidence and accuracy. Obviously, this becomes even more important when we're using high dose per fraction treatments. And SBRT really uh, is sort of the model that, of integration across the treatment process uh, with the mobilization, IGRT, and then treatment and planning and delivery technologies. Uh, mobilization, as we know, can reduce interfraction and interfraction motion but not eliminate it, so it's not perfect. In addition, IGRT is very good at uh, assuring accurate tumor positioning prior to treatment, but it often requires additional technology to monitor patients during treatment or invasive procedures, and I'll talk about some of the disadvantages of that. I think whatever machine you use in combination with SGRT for SBRT, we can all agree that all of them probably have some technical challenge that we deal with, uh, and this tends to especially come up when we're treating SBRT patients. So when I first arrived uh, at our center, we were doing SBRT primarily on a cyber knife, and our goal was to convert that over to a true beam. And so there was a process by which we went to sort of uh, integrate new immobilization techniques, but also new technology. So initially, uh, they were setting up just two patient marks prior to IGRT for SBRT, and we were seeing shifts on the order of 15 to 20 millimeters. Uh, we'd e even see shifts up to three centimeters in some patients, uh, especially with poor body habitus. Um, and that was something I, I would get a little bit nervous about, honestly. Uh, where I did my training, they still are using uh, a true uh, stereotactic frame with a fiducial coordinate system. And so I was used to seeing much less uh, patient shifts between uh, setup and IGRT. And so we initially, before we installed OSMS, uh, we're doing kind of a two-step process to uh, reduce interfraction motion. And then we integrated OSMS into that, into that process and kind of compared the two. So the process um, for this is similar to anything else uh, that we use SGRT for. We define our region of interest based on the simulation uh, CT. Uh, we use this for initial setup for DICOM. We acquire IGRT and then uh, correct position based on uh, volumetric imaging. And then most of what I'm going to talk about initially is going to be done in free breathing patients. So uh, we acquire a respiratory gated surface uh, reference and treatment position. I think some of the points that uh, are, are important to make for SBRT specifically are just to make sure you're excluding items uh, that may not be present on other types of treatments, such as abdominal compression plates. Oftentimes our vac locks are bigger for SBRT, and so we uh, need to make sure that none of that is in the reference image to make it uh, accurate. Uh, and then we monitor the patient uh, using this reference image and we can uh, hold a beam as we know uh, when the patient is out of tolerance. So when we integrated OSMS into SBRT, we kind of uh, compared a two-step IGRT procedure to OSMS followed by cone beam CT. Uh, we uh, presented this data at ASTRO last year um, based on 71 lesions and 58 patients uh, and kind of compared the shifts that we got on comb beam CT for, for each of those techniques. Uh, we also looked at a lot of different patient factors and tumor position as well as tumor motion to see if that affected uh, some of uh, what we were seeing as far as uh, technique. This just so shows a nice schema of what our initial experiment was. We would uh, 
line up to patient marks on a daily basis and then alternate in between uh, further patient setup either with OSMS or uh, KV-KV match with bone, uh, with bony match and then go on to volumetric imaging with uh, comb MCT. We, would, uh, we uh, recorded all of our shifts uh, to compare uh, as I showed in the last slide. And I think we could all expect that uh, these two methods would be similar uh, and both achieve very uh, reasonable setups prior to uh, IGRT. Uh, we were, uh, were very pleased with how comparable the data was between the two techniques. There really wasn't any significant difference in additional shifts uh, for all the degrees of freedom. Other than the longitudinal direction, we did see a slight difference in longitudinal shift of about a millimeter. Um, as you can see, we uh, treated several different locations of tumors, primarily in the lung, uh, but also some abdominal tumors, so we were getting data for, for different sites of disease. Um, I think what's most comforting about this data is that our shifts are very low, so no matter what direction uh, we were monitoring, uh, setting the patient up in, our shifts were five millimeters or less uh, on additional IGRT, so that, that was kind of what I was wanting to see. Um, and, and showed us that we could really use OSMS in this uh, capacity. We saw a couple differences, um, some of them expected, some of them not so much expected uh, in how patient uh, factors may uh, affect shifts. We saw a little bit of an effect on, of BMI on vertical shift, which we honestly, we expected BMI to be one of the factors that may fall out. <clears throat> that also played a, a role in uh, the quantity of the shift of role we did see some range of motion differences, but just for rotation. But none of these were something that we saw a high enough correlation to really, really uh, didn't think OSMS was, a, was capable of, of doing this for initial patient setup. <clears throat> Probably more of the reason we wanted to integrate OSMS into SBRT was for the continuous monitoring aspect, as, as most of us uh, integrate this into other types of treatment. Um, but wasn't a lot of a data other than SRS on, on how good it was uh, for interfraction monitoring, how well did it correlate with internal shifts. We set a very low threshold for uh, beam hold um, of two millimeters. Uh, that was intentional. Uh, we do a, a standard PTV margin of five millimeters, but we wanted to see if we monitor these patients closely, whether we'd be comfortable uh, reducing margins at some point. Uh, we also set a time threshold of two seconds. Uh, that's because, again, these patients are free breathing, so there's going to be some variability uh, based on the position in the respiratory cycle. And then we just started recording this data, so the suggested shifts by OSMS if the patient went out of uh, the threshold uh, and what additional shifts were made on repeat comb MCT. So we're still acquiring this data, but this, this uh, initial data will be presented after this year. Uh, we've had 20 instances of interfraction motion detected um, by OSMS. This resulted in 15 clinically meaningful shifts on additional comb MCT. So about a 75% of the time when we detect something on OSMS, it leads to what we would consider a clinically meaningful shift on comb MCT. Um, also, uh, we saw a very good correlation between the, the project, projected shift of OSMS and the reality shift of comb MCT. Um, so right about three millimeters on average. Um, you can see the raw <clears throat> data uh, here. Uh, the blue is uh, what is the suggested shift by OSMS, and the orange is the uh, actual shift performed on comb MCT. So most of those correlate very nicely. There were some instances, though, where OSMS detected what we considered uh, to be a potential interfraction motion and the comb MCT shift was actually uh, greater. Uh, in fact, a couple of them approached our five millimeter PTV margin. So uh, the nice thing to see about that is we're detecting that uh, on, with the system. And so uh, uh, even though the correlation for those time points or those two points is not as high as what we saw on average, um, the system is detecting that. And so we feel we're, we're catching that at the time of, of the shift. <clears throat> if you look at uh, just the individual parameters for shifts. Again, the correlation is pretty high other than in the longitudinal direction, which was a little bit different, but not statistically different. Um, but overall, the correlation was quite high in all, all the degrees of freedom. 
So there's various, obviously, techniques to do continuous KV imaging on different machines. We have TrueBeam, so uh, we were starting to play around with the idea of doing a combination of both internal and external monitoring and how that would work within the clinic uh, with the use of triggered imaging capabilities on TrueBeam with OSMS simultaneously. I think, obviously, within SPRT, it's very logical to use the combination of these. Um, and specifically, we've been using it for prostate, spine, and, and our SRS brain patients. So the process is similar. We set the patient up with OSMS, do IGRT, then we monitor with OSMS, and simultaneously do triggered imaging during the treatment with either bone or fiducial match. Uh, one thing currently is that you, can, you have to choose your beam hold method if you're going to use both of these. So you can't hold the beam uh, with both uh, OSMS and triggered imaging. So we pick what we hold the beam with, with how reliable we feel the monitoring technique is. Um, currently, we're working on whether within developer mode, we're able to, to decouple that aspect of the treatment course so that we could potentially beam hold with both, uh, with both techniques. So here's an example <clears throat> where I think it, this is uh, kind of where it makes the most sense to do. Um, we have a prostate SBRT case. Uh, this patient had fiducials that were implanted, which is standard, and we used trigger imaging with the capabilities on TrueBeam to track those fiducials through the treatment. Uh, we took images every uh, few seconds. You can obviously vary that by how often you want to image the patient, and there's a nice algorithm that uh, you can use to, to track those fiducials and, and whatever gantry angle you're at. Uh, but simultaneously, we were monitoring the patient externally with, with OSMS, so uh, we we're quite comfortable that the patient was not moving externally and that the fiducials internally were, were where they should be. I'll go back. So <clears throat> a little bit of, you know, suggestion on SPRT spine and SRS brain because uh, triggered imaging only has the ability to really track fiducials into uh, beam hold based on fiducials currently. Uh, we use OSMS for beam hold in those cases. Again, we're working to see if we can uncouple a little bit of the restrictions within TrueBeam uh, to allow us to, to use some of the bony anatomy to, to do triggered imaging and actually beam hold off that if we want to. Uh, but that's something we'll, we'll be looking into in the future. So I'm gonna switch, uh, pivot a little bit to respiratory management. Um, we know <clears throat> that tumors move with respiration and that this needs to be managed, uh, accounted for and managed and there's several different techniques to do this that exist. We obviously have crude techniques like inhibition, uh, and then we have uh, more advanced techniques like gating and tracking. Um, so <clears throat> inhibition of respiration is really probably the best example or most widely used example of this is abdominal compression. Um, this forces chest wall breathing. Um, I don't know if you can play the, the videos, but um, I have a, well, anyway. I have a couple of videos there that basically show that it's very effective at reducing motion as we've quantified on both you know, x-ray uh, but also 4D CT data. There's a lot of papers on that. But it doesn't eliminate motion. Um, I think another important thing that's uh, often lost on us is how it can affect uh, organs at risk, especially in abdominal targets um, within the liver, for instance, or we now treat a lot of SBRT for lymph nodes and uh, other things within the abdomen. and so. Uh, abdominal compression can often push organs towards the target, and I'll show an example of that. And it can be uncomfortable for the patient. I think no one likes uh, being compressed. I've not yet uh, met a patient that told me to continue to compress them harder. Um, and certainly patients that have uh, unfavorable body habitus, you know, it's, it can be difficult to get good compression on those patients and really get them to breathe with, with their chest wall. So um, there's still some role for, for further management. Uh, in my opinion. <clears throat> we can track tumors. Uh, there's various techniques. Obviously, we have systems like CyberKnife that can uh, track uh, the tumor itself, visualize the tumor. We also have uh, uh, systems that track implanted fiducials or implanted markers like Calypso. Um, but there's, there's limitations to this. Sometimes the uh, tracking can be limited by tumor location, uh, as in CyberKnife. Um, fiducials and markers require invasive procedures, which I think is an important thing to consider for patients, especially for abdominal targets like liver. 
Um, we're, <clears throat> we really represent one of three ways to treat liver metastases, or if, if not more. I mean, there's more and more ways to treat liver metastases at every day, it seems. Um, and at our institution, we're the only one that really doesn't require an evasive procedure. So if we're going to require everybody to get Calypso beacons or everybody to get uh, implanted fiducials so we can track their tumors, I think that's uh, potentially uh, downgrades us as an option, especially when we're talking about RFA techniques that easily could treat those tumors uh, potentially in the same way with the same procedure. So SBRT is non-invasive for a reason, and so if we can eliminate some of these invasive procedures and still accurately treat tumors, uh, that's a plus for the patient and for the clinic. <clears throat> and then we have breath hold techniques. Uh, there's various technologies that do this uh, to stabilize the tumor within the respiratory cycle. Uh, sometimes this requires a purchase of additional equipment. So. Um, ABC, for instance, is, a, is some equipment that I don't have uh, currently at my clinic, but um, if I asked them to purchase this, uh, I would probably get some, some raised eyebrows as to why we need to do this. So OSMS is a beautiful way to potentially uh, do SBRT with breath hold, and, and I know there's a lot of ongoing research, and we're, we're looking into expanding our experience in that. So we've been doing that for a couple years now, integrating it in the clinic. Um, I don't have any real data to present today. We're, we're acquiring that data, uh, but, <clears throat> but it's not robust enough really for a presentation. But I thought I would present a case really where this made a lot of sense uh, in a patient where I think it was really helpful. Um, this is a 72-year-old woman that had a prior lung cancer on the right, uh, treated her with a lobectomy in 2014. She was uh, imaged uh, routinely, and uh, that showed a left lower lobe mass that was enlarging, that was avid on PET-CT. Um, also, some images here in a second, but this is an extremely air, hard area to biopsy. She did actually have atypical cells seen on her lavage during bronchoscopy, and so she was presumed to have a secondary malignancy and was referred for uh, SBRT to this tumor. She wasn't a candidate for surgical resection based on her PFTs. So this is kind of difficult to appreciate, but this is one of the more precarious positions in the lung that I've probably ever treated, and I've treated hundreds of SBRT lung cases. Um, so this tumor was essentially right at the base of the lung, uh, tethered to the diaphragm, uh, right above the stomach, <laughs> so, uh, and right lateral to the esophagus. So two real dose-limiting OARs uh, within the constraints that we use for SBRT that I had to consider, uh, both, both from a planning technique, but more importantly from a motion management technique, since this uh, tumor definitely did move quite a bit with respiration, as you would expect, being right on the diaphragm. So this patient was set up uh, in our standard immobilization. We did abdominal compression to start, and we did a 4D CT with and without compression. And then we took additional CTs at max inspiration and expiration and looked at all of those really uh, to see what was the best technique to treat the patient in. And we really found, and I'll show uh, evidence of this, that the, the ins max inspiration uh, uh, part, of the breath, uh, part of the respiratory cycle was the best to treat her in and led to the best uh, treatment, but also to the least uh, risk of toxicity. <clears throat> so if you look at our volumes with compression and free breathing, the inner, inner line is the ITV, the outer line is the PTV. So again, we're, we're compressing the patient, so the motion was uh, reduced quite a bit in this, uh, but we had to treat the tumor over the entire respiratory cycle. Uh, we added our standard PTV margin. As you can see, the, the volume superior inferiorly is gonna be a lot more than uh, the next case with, with breath hold. And in addition, the overlap uh, with the stomach is gonna be a lot more. Probably what you can appreciate on this, but uh, you can somewhat appreciate better on axial imaging is that the compression plate was actually pushing not the upper part of the stomach, which was right under the tumor, but the medial part of the stomach towards the target. And so volumetrically, there was a lot less overlap of the kind of the mean 50% dose with the stomach as well uh, with, with using breath hold. <clears throat> Compare that to the, the volumes with breath hold. Again, not, the volume itself is not that much less. It is less, but the, the way in which the volume is less was key in that it, the superior inferior expansion of, uh, that we had to use uh, was, was our inferior ex superior expansion that we had to use was much less than uh, the, the first case. And the overlap resulting on the stomach was much less, and so we're able to reduce the dose to the stomach quite a bit. <clears throat> we used a rapid arc technique on this, just from uh, not our standard 
planning for SBRT, but uh, when we do have an organ at risk, we tend to use rapid arc to try to modulate the dose around that organ, uh, limit the hotspot, uh, not within the target itself, but within the organ at risk. And you can see some of the, the mean, uh, the 50% dose kind of <clears throat> going out into the stomach. In addition, the, the max dose with the overlap for the PTV was, was quite a bit higher compared to this, which you can see uh, we eliminated some of the overlap. We're able to modulate that 50% dose a lot more <clears throat> superiorly and kind of spreading the dose out laterally as opposed to forcing some of the dose inferiorly. <clears throat> Just the gross DVH comparison uh, for those two plans. So the maximum dose of the stomach on this plan for free breathing was almost 46 gray compared to 36 gray for breath hold. So a 10 gray reduction in max dose is pretty significant. Uh, especially when the suggested tolerance for five fractions is 35 gray. And so we, <clears throat> we still exceeded the suggested tolerance, uh, which, you know, my physicist will often be like, are you okay with that? And I'm like, yeah, I'm okay with one gray above tolerance, but I wasn't okay with 11 gray above tolerance, especially in light of the volume that was receiving some of the median dose, 4.4 um, uh, uh, cc's compared to 0 0.6 cc's for the for the breath hold case. And so significant reduction in both maximum dose, but significant reduction in volume, which often we can argue is probably a, a, a much more important parameter for SBRT. <clears throat> so just conclusions, I think uh, there's a lot of ways you can integrate OSMS into SBRT treatments um, from patient setup to continuous monitoring. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I think the data really points that, the, that this is an important uh, technology to add in detecting antifraction motion if you're not otherwise doing it with continuous KV imaging or other techniques. Um, and I think breath hold during SBRT is something we need to look at uh, as far as our research, uh, whether it's a trial or uh, quantifying the data, much like we quantified uh, uh, with an antifraction monitoring to, uh, to really serve as a promising method for tumors in certain locations, maybe not all tumors, but certainly the location uh, in the lower part of the lungs or near uh, organs at risk. I think this is a, a great technique to potentially reduce toxicity and uh, potentially reduce margins as well. So appreciate everybody's time. Happy to take some questions. You mentioned that in the uh, SBRT prostate and uh, use triggered imaging together with OSM, OSMS. If they give you conflicting results, which one do you choose and how do you, why do you choose like that? We, in that instance, we chose the fiducials. Um, and that's not based on lack of data for, uh, like I said, when, when we quantified the data even for abdominal tumors, we were very confident that OSMS was, was detecting interfraction motion. But as we've seen in Calypso, um, there is some motion during treatment that, that may not be detected externally, whether it's uh, rectal gas that may, may shift during treatment. Um, we've seen that on some of the Calypso data we did actually at Southwestern. Um, whether that matters dosimetrically is another question. Um, we, you know, we don't use a rectal balloon, which was one difference between the experience we had at Southwestern, but, um, but uh, we, used, we were confident that if we were, we were tracking fiducials, we were tracking the patient as well. In your lung case, mm -hmm. obviously you had the option of using breath hold because the patient could do it, but most of your lung cancer patients are not going to be able to breath hold or are not going to be able to breath hold well. Mm -hmm. Have you, how do you finesse you know, breath hold for short periods with a deli planned delivery system versus you know, your other options, which are either gating or ITV? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, I, not all lung patients are going to be able to tolerate breath hold. Uh, we've had that happen to us. Um, I think one thing we've worked on is, is coaching breath hold. We don't really do a deep inspiration breath hold uh, like you would do for breast. I mean, we're doing a very moderate breath hold. Um, I think that allows them to, to potentially last a little longer. We use uh, accessories like oxygen to improve patient comfort. I think that leads to a little bit more success. Um, but there have been patients where we've, we've had to abort and go to other either gating procedures or, or we don't have another procedure to go to that's for gating. So it's either respiratory gating with OSMS or free breathing. So 
Uh, if I had <clears throat> you know, ABC or another technique to do gating, I certainly would look at that uh, as potentially a, a way to reduce some of the patient discomfort. Just um, a couple of questions, actually. Would you ever consider treating in exhale? So sort of reverse breath hold, if you like. So your patient breathes out and maintains an exhale. And also, have you ever um, compressed, not at diaphragm level, but actually further down the abdomen? I have not, um, to answer your second question. Um, we're, we really focus on getting chest wall breathing with, with patients. So that, that is one aspect of my training that I probably appreciated more after my training than, uh, than during it um, is just how much coaching really plays a part. Um, we haven't played around with that. I'd love to, to pick your brain if that's something you guys are doing. Um, and uh, we have looked at expiration. Uh, I can't say that I feel that patients tolerate it any better than inspiration, um, but we certainly, like I said, in, in that case, we looked at expiration on expiration scan. The volumes were, were similar um, as far as the OARs and, and things like that. And so we didn't feel like it uh, was any advantage for expiration, but we certainly aren't opposed to looking at it. All right, thanks. <laughs>